This hillside near Baku has been on fire for as long as anyone can remember. Fueled by natural gas, it is evidence of Azerbaijan's extraordinary natural resources. Oil wealth turned this city into a cosmopolitan European capital a century ago, and oil wealth is transforming Baku once again. A new pipeline will soon pump billions of more petrodollars into Azerbaijan's economy. With foreign interest in Azerbaijan's oil came foreign interest in its politics. On November 6, voters here will elect a new parliament. After international criticism of previous elections, the authoritarian government says it has reformed the process. It is now easier to run for office, and more than 2,000 candidates have entered the race. But the opposition fears these changes are merely cosmetic, and the government will use fraud just as it has in the past. Despite a decree by President Ilham Aliyev that many hoped would make elections more fair, the government is still given to violent reprisals. Last month, as opposition members tried to rally in downtown Baku, police swept through the city, beating and arresting them. Police made little distinction between opposition supporters and hapless citizens caught up in the melee. <laughs> Most people from Azerbaijan will never learn the opposition side of this story. President Aliyev's government controls most of the electronic media, which emphasizes the stability and prosperity of the country. Aliyev himself has soothed many in the West with a style that is articulate and reassuring about democratic progress. He stresses prosperity and incremental reform. We are trying to, to create a normal society, a modern society, based on the democratic principles, uh, rule of law, and freedoms, but we need time for that. The orange touches here, in opposition headquarters, are a sign that Aliyev's critics are tired of waiting. By evoking the color of Ukraine's orange revolution, they too are making an appeal to the West. Murad Ghassanli, a young man with Azeri roots and a degree from the London School of Economics, has come to Baku to advise the opposition on what may become a revolution. If the authorities decide to, uh, which they will probably, to falsify the, uh, the electoral, electoral process and the results, and, um, etc. The opposition will have no other option but to take people to the streets. One American critic thinks all this orange is just about branding. There's surprisingly little patience with the opposition among many outside observers. Color orange, it became the number one symbol of the opposition. But for all their flaws, the risks they take are real. These young men gathered one afternoon to protest the arrest of a young political leader accused on what are likely trumped up political charges. Like many who land in Azerbaijan's jails, his next stop was the hospital. It's just so difficult to do anything, to even take whatever little steps. I mean, the civil rights movement were able to make huge marches into the center of Washington without being you know, dispersed uh, by, uh, you know, by police. At least they were able to take these, these steps. But in, in, in Azerbaijan, every little form of, of protest is met with force. Drive out of the self-centered enclave of Baku, and you find a different world and a different politics. In regional towns and villages, where the basic problems are poverty and pandemic corruption, the blood feed between the opposition and the government has little resonance. Life goes on, people get married, and bad governance is a fact as old as the stones. But that doesn't mean that talking politics is easy. Local representatives of the presidential administration run these villages like personal fiefdoms. I can't say anything about the government. And many people are afraid to talk of their deep anger and frustration on camera. The problem is the people in the parliament. None of the people knock my door and ask how I have been doing. We don't feel any support from those people. 
Shaksanambaramova belongs to one group, however, that will always talk. Displaced by the war between Azerbaijan and Armenia, she and other refugees have seen it all. Corruption, neglect, indifference. I don't even know the place where I can go and express my complaints. Anger like this would be a wild card in a free election. You don't have to go to the countryside to find deep frustration with the current government. Corruption and arrogance are everywhere in Azerbaijan. And often, people only learn afterward of basic decisions that affect their daily lives. A building boom in Baku, fueled, say, insiders by the oil and money laundering, is transforming the capital but leaving many behind. This wall suddenly appeared one day in a housing project, blocking residents from the small gardens that are the only sanctuary from their cramped and crumbling housing. They don't know who was building it or why, but the rumor is yet another tower or a new apartment house. My life will be very bad because my wife passed away and I spent the days here in this garden. Where will I be sitting when there is no garden? This sort of thing happens often. This time, a local candidate intervened and secured a promise, allowing them to keep small passages to their gardens. The compromise will probably last only until the election, said one politician. Some younger candidates are tapping into public anger at the general poverty and corruption in Azerbaijan society. Dadash Alisad's family was displaced by the war in Nagorno-Karabakh. He is now running to represent other displaced people. His district is currently occupied by Armenia, but his people live and vote here, in these squalid and neglected apartment houses. Elishab is one of a new generation of candidates. They want no part of the old argument between the government and the opposition. He's campaigning as an independent, trying to convince voters that he actually wants to serve them and not his own business prospects. But it's hard work to convince voters here that politicians care. The word independent is very slippery. Contempt for politicians of all kinds, ruling party and opposition, makes the independent label attractive, and many claim it who have other allegiances. Alishov may also find that once you criticize the failures of the current government, you might as well be in the opposition. Nobody knows how long the oil boom will last, perhaps 10 or 20 years, maybe longer. But without reform, oil could ruin this country, just as it has ruined this landscape. Already, it is securing an indifferent elite above an increasingly disaffected society. If you ask people in Azerbaijan about democracy, you find they don't care so much about what their parliament will look like politically. What they want is a parliament that is effective, with representatives who will listen and tend to their needs, and visit the communities they supposedly serve. The ruling party isn't monolithic, and the opposition isn't filled with Vaslav Havels. But greed breeds distrust, and distrust soon becomes cynicism. And cynicism is the most effective deterrent to democracy. So there is a sense of urgency among reformers. The raw material they have to work with, political hope, may be as non-renewable as the gas that feeds these flames. 